All righty, we'd like to welcome you to BlackUSA.News. My name's Donnie Glover. Ladies and gentlemen, we apologize for the delay, but trust me when I tell you, this one is worth the wait. The one, the only, the incomparable, the indomitable, all the way from the Lumbee peoples, Milton Hunt. How are you, Mr. Motivation? Hey, Donnie, how are you this morning? Glad to be here with you. It's raining outside, but that's a good sign. We call that liquid sunshine in my neighborhood. Yeah, mean, means the food prices won't be as high as they could be. Well, it's, it's always in abundance. Every time something happens in the environment, somebody benefits. It's just a positive about the way you think about it, the way you see it. See, Milton, I met you maybe, what, 20 years ago, somewhere around the empowerment zone. Well, here's how I know when you met me. I was younger, better looking, less gray hair, and didn't weigh as much. Okay. 20 years ago. Matter of fact, I can tell you when it was. We were at a place called Empower Baltimore. And we were on 3 Frederick, I believe it was Frederick Street, right across from the police station. Marketplace. Marketplace, that's right. You know, the old fire, the old Bruce Chris used to be there right across from the fire department. I mean, the police department. We had some interesting conversations, and little did I know you would become this national star as we were just pondering around what might Empire Baltimore be. International. Oh, goodness gracious. Ah, I'm not going to get invited back for sure now. Internationally, no. Yeah, we've been to the Middle East and Africa too. Just trying to tell a story, trying to tell a story that the mainstream media often does not tell. I, I want to cut to the chase. Look, okay. I saw a video that you produced. All right. Maybe we ought to show it here. Can we show it here? Yeah, go ahead. Is that the one where I was with the folks in Trinidad? No, the video you did about okay. indigenous peoples. I, I oh you yeah 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 that's the one that's the one I did last year I, uh, I've done fifty or sixty since then Donnie I apologize but uh well, that, was about was very, that was very special to me I know which one you're talking about you're talking about the one titled Native Americans we're not a people of the past we are a people of the present that's the one you're talking about go ahead Ronnie Don, Donnie roll it roll it. Well, I thought you were going to load it. I, I didn't have it uploaded. I thought you... Hold on. I can get it up here. I mean... I guess he's going to come back and get that going for a second. We're talking with Mr. Milton Hunt, Mr. Motivation. He's going to share with us some information about the indigenous peoples. And yes, it is some liquid sunshine in the city of Baltimore today. Thank God for the sunshine. And thank God for the rain, too. Let's see what you got. Donnie. Any luck? All right, so let me see now. We're going to screen share this, right? Yeah, click share. Yeah, hey, I got that. And you let me it right in that box. I'm going to put I'm going to put this on another screen though, so it'll be a little easier. Let's put it up here. Oh. You may want to say hello to Tavis Redtail. He's up in Philadelphia. Tavis Redtail. Well, hello, Tavis. Very nice to meet you, my friend. Out of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. All right, so let's share this video. We'll share the screen. Uh, share screen. Come on. Uh, why does it not let me do that? That's not what we want to click. We want to click share screen. And we have more than one monitor here. 
And when we say share screen, it's bringing me back to its original screen. So I'll see what it must do. All right, so here we go. I got to do it this way. We will figure this out. I love your confidence. We are not a people of the past. We are a people of the present. Many of our daily conversations surround our cultural and racial differences. People tend to talk about all the things that separate us versus the things that bring us together. I am full-blooded Native American from the Lumbee tribe out of North Carolina. When my parents moved to Baltimore in the 50s to escape their agricultural background in search of new opportunities in this thriving manufacturing town, they told me countless stories of how race and culture impacted them and separated them on a daily basis. Some 70 years later, I still see how the divide of race and culture impacts my people. Whether it's the 22% of all Native Americans that live on reservations or the remainder of us that live in urban and rural settings, we've got to stop this census divide. Here's some facts that I bet you probably weren't even aware of. Native Americans represent the smallest minority group in the United States. Native Americans represent somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2% of the entire population of the United States. So why am I sharing this with you? My whole life I've had to look through a lens of a culture of people that didn't even really understand who I am. My whole life I've had to learn to live, work, and play with people from different cultures and different races. My whole life I've had to understand who they are. Many of you are simply misunderstood. Why? Because of the colors of your skin, your ethnicity, your race, your culture maybe even your background. How much longer will we insist that your culture is more important than mine? I'm not saying don't be proud of who you are. I'm saying understand this, that our country is made up of people from all backgrounds, all races, and all ethnicities. Here's a famous quote I bet you've heard before. I long for the day when man is not judged by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. I plead with you today, please let's stop this census divide of people over race. It's time for all races of people to step up and embrace each other. I have two simple recommendations for ways that we can mend the painful divide our ancestors have created. First, Let's focus on your neighbor's similarities versus the colors of their skin. Next, for the differences you find among your neighbors, let's choose to embrace and to celebrate them. At the end of the day, folks, we all want the same thing. Love, peace of mind, security, happiness, and the ability to perform and to provide for our family. I am Milton Hunt. I'm your diversity and inclusion trainer. I'm your cultural awareness expert. All right, let's get into it. Okay, let's let's move forward. Two percent of Americans' population is indigenous, Native Americans. Only two percent. Yeah, but now let me help you qualify that because that sounds uh, to the to our listening audience they may be a little confused there. Okay, so what is that two percent reflective of? Native Americans are the only pe- group of people in the United States that have to prove who we are by blood. You must have twenty five percent of a tribal identity or a tribe's blood running through your veins to be classified as a tribal member. I've had the pleasure of doing my genealogy back to the early 1800s and discovering both my mom and dad were from the same tribe and our tribal roots lands there, which now affords me the opportunity to have a tribal card. So there's a lot of people can say they've got Native American in them because I wouldn't doubt it. 
but that 2% is reflective of what the government recognizes card carrying members. Now we already know in today's society, you could be multi-generational, multi-culture, and you may have Caucasian, African-American, Native American, Filipino, Asian, whatever it may be, but the truth of the matter is the federal government only recognizes those that are tribally affiliated. Now, Donnie, let me take it one step further. Isn't that insulting? Say it again. Isn't that insulting? Um, yeah, but what I was about to tell you is even more insulting than that. So we, <laughs> we have to prove who we are by blood, so then therefore we have to have a card. So let me give you an idea. So in 1985, Donnie, when we were working kind of at, at uh, Empire Baltimore, I decided I was going down to 301 West Preston Street and get a business license, only to discover when going there, the box said, you know, filling out the application, white, black, or other. And, you know, my father was insistent growing up that you will be Native American and you're going to be very proud of who you are. And I was involved with a, a lot of the folk, cultural folklore. The, the, the tribal practices, dancing, drumming, and all that kind of stuff growing up. So I really understood I was Native American. My father made sure, as I said, I went to Native American church, Native American senior centers, the Native American community centers, you know, it was in our community. So I took that box down and drew another box on there and put Native American and checked that box. Little did I know that the lady who was receiving my application that day would say, Mr. Hunt, you can't deface a government form. And I simply looked at her and said, I'm not defacing it. I'm improving it because you must know who we are. You must recognize. So the story I was going to tell you that really should alarm you is this. There's about nine members of the Indian Senate subcommittee that sit in Washington that decide who are these federally recognized tribes. And they make a decision based upon roles, language, history, and some other pertinent facts. And then they will then determine if you are federally recognized, which is even one step further than having this card. Now the government has appropriations, there's hospitals, education, housing, there's a whole host of things. So it's interesting that the white man still today decides who we, who we are. And this power structure base called Congress, that's the voting block to determine whether or not. Just interesting. It's interesting and appalling at the same time. Have you ever heard of the five civilized tribes? Uh, I know there's the, the tribes out of New York that they talk about the the, the, um, the Tuscarora, the, the, the Mohawk, those tribes out of, North Carolina, out of New York, but not the five civilized. Which ones are they? Okay, so the five civilized tribes in, is a term used since 1866. Okay. To designate the Cherokee the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Creek, and Seminole in what was then called Indian Territory. Today we know it as Oklahoma. So <laughs> long story short, when the Blacks and the Seminoles, and some of the Blacks were slaves, mm -hmm. when they began to trail the tears to Oklahoma, once they got out to Oklahoma, they came up because you mentioned earlier the roles, the different roles. Well, one was called the Dawes Rolls, D-A-W-E-S. And this was essentially where white people determined who was in the five civilized tribes and who was not. And remember, the Seminoles is really not a tribe. That was a European name given to it means it comes from Cimarrones, meaning the wild ones. So remember, that as they pushed Indians, native people into Florida as a part of the Indian removal, the combination group blended with the creeks that were down there. And that's how that whole thing got going. Mm -hmm. So it was somebody else labeling the indigenous peoples what they thought they were. Mm -hmm. Some of them were Creek, but they were lumped together with the Seminoles mm -hmm. and they're totally different cultures. But what's most audacious to me is simply where some white people determine mm -hmm. what your race is. 
regardless yep. of what your grandmother, your great grandmother told you, your <laughs> great grandfather, hear these white guys. And as it went, as it relates to Oklahoma, they would look at you, for instance, and say, "Oh, you are Native American." Mm -hmm. But they would look at me and say, "Oh, because of your skin complexion, it's impossible for you to be Native American." Yeah. Who in the hell are they to determine that? Well, Dan, well, Donnie, let me just, I appreciate uh, the fact that you, such a historian and taking time to do the research to, to go that far back, but let me just take you to 1968. In 1968, we were, the government labeled us Indians. That's what we were, we were Indians. It's and you know, 1968. Yeah, up in the 68, we were Indians. That's what our name was. And somewhere in that time frame, it changed. It changed to American Indians slightly after that. And the reason for the cha name change once again was is there was infusion of people coming from India, and we needed to be able to distinguish were you from India or from America. So we just became American Indians. And that was the title for the longest time. Which is insulting. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I personally just believe that we should just be called Indians. That's what our original name was. We're very indigenous to the land. Get, it, our name changed. So then let me fast forward. We even got yet another name change that the government decided. And somewhere in the 90s, we became Native Americans. So it just is kind of fascinating that we watch the people in power, the people with the influence, the, the decision makers, Decide what's going to happen over our lives, over over our culture, and more importantly, they really try to impact our belief systems to such a strong way that that's actually the scariest part of it all. What do you mean? Well, think about it like this: there's three there there's something to be said for belief systems. Donnie, if I could change the belief system of man, I could have world peace tomorrow. Because I could change the way you think. I could, I could say that we shouldn't be at war with this group and that group. I could talk about, you know, different races and cultures, but we can't change people's belief systems. We can only give them enough information that allow them to change their own belief system. My belief system has changed many, many times over the course of my life. From the time I was 18 to the time I had kids to the time I've now turned 60, I've watched my own belief system change. But I've been the one that has changed it not anyone else. But the government really has a strong role in wanting to control your belief system, believing that the lies, the, pro the, the broken promises, the, the, the fact that our people were led to believe that these are your lands and treaties and trust and land rights and burial grounds, only to see those promises broken. Do we believe them? No. We probably would say many times you've heard this white man speak with forked tongue. And really, you know, it's just in, in, in today's culture, the young kids say talking out of both sides of his neck, you know. So we kind of understand that what's really happening is just trying to influence our belief system. We know better because of what we've seen. We don't believe what you say. We watch what you do. And that's what we believe. So that's what I mean when I say they're trying to impact our belief systems. To, to even further tell you, you know, they would like us to believe that this separation is good for us, you know, not bringing cultures of people together. But the truth of the matter is, if you think about the 33% of the population that's, that's uh, Hispanic, and you think about the 16, 17%, whichever numbers you look at, 15% African American, and you think about putting all the various minority groups together, what a tremendous voice we would have. But it's better to keep us separated. On Saturday, I gave an address where this is what I said. By design, it was intended to separate us. That was by design. And then it's even further by design that we keep it separated. But the challenge lies is people of color, we even separate ourselves even further. And Donnie, when you separate something, the smaller you break it into pieces, the harder it is to put back together. I see some similarities 
between the native challenges, I mean, Native American, uh, Indian American, I mean, black, Negro, colored. Mm -hmm. A lot of similarities. And, 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 and the people don't necessarily agree on any one term. All right, so let me just make it real simple. At the end of the day, I don't care what race you are, what nationality you are, and it was in the video. It said, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. Love, peace of mind, the ability to perform. We want the ability to protect our families, provide. We, we all want some core things. Happiness. Happiness, yes. It doesn't matter what color you are, race you are. However, we bought into the lie. People, the, the people of color bought into the lie. The lie that you don't get that unless you get this. Man, the greatest strength comes from being happy within. That's the greatest, that's the greatest strength. Being at peace with yourself. Being one with your spirit and not having all this confusion and turmoil. You know, Donnie, at 60 years old, that in this journey of life I've been on, been in the wilderness many, many times. And the wilderness has been a place where I've had some of the greatest growth in my life in the wilderness. But I refuse to let the wilderness get inside of me while I'm on this journey because I know I'm coming out on the other side. So we, we must remember who we are and stop believing every lie that's told to us about what we're not. The propaganda machine will keep you believing that people of color, all they're doing is destroying each other. Well, there's probably a small subset that that could be true. But that's not indicative of the whole group. We're painting people with a broad brush when the truth of the matter is we should open our eyes and recognize. Red Tail, come on in. I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. Great day to you. How are you? Beautiful discussion today. Thank you. What you thinking, Tavis? Uh, I, I would like to acknowledge and pray honor to our elder, Mr. Hunt. Well, my <sighs> elder, Mr. Hunt, thank you. And um, thank you for sharing your perspective. Um, you. My mother, we're in the car, my mother and I, we have a nonprofit. We work closely together from a perspective of educating the public of uh, omitted history of the indigenous populations. Yes. And you know, seeing as though I'm a melanated individual from the Southeast, you know, we pay heavily attention to the Southeastern portions of the United States and that history that started way before 1619 and then again, you know, we talk about uh, revisiting the history as a part of mainstream history and uh, educational systems. We acknowledge that it's colonial history. And just like Mr. Hunt said, you know, mm -hmm. the, the divide et impere, which is an old Latin, a Latin frame, a, a Latin term that was used. It means divide and conquer or divide and rule. Divide mm -hmm. et impere. And it was uh, what the church was using as the part of his missionizing, you know, here in the in the states. And so, I would just like to acknowledge a point, which was that the division and the reality that, as Native, Indigenous, Indian population, we are still acknowledging and using utilizing the colonizer system to identify us, mm -hmm. and and that from the legal aspect, from the legal perspective, if once you allow a collective group to identify you, you you are um, underneath that jurisdiction and you are underneath that control. And so as a part of my uh, share experience and what I'm asking for from the collective African-American population and the collective indigenous population is to look outside of our subjugators and to look outside of our colonizers mm -hmm. and educate themselves about how to conduct business with the outside world. And, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a student of uh, education and law from an indigenous perspective. And so, you know, whether, whether you're in a black community or the indigenous community, uh, self-identification, self-determination, you know, yeah. and what Mr. Hunt is talking about is autonomy. That's where, you know, I want to see us go to autonomy with respect to how we identify ourselves, how we educate ourselves, mm -hmm. 
and eventually, you know, get those experienced individuals to help us with the collective economics and social changes necessary. But we got to do it ourselves, our subjugated and the systems, no matter who's in control. Even if somebody our color or from our, our heritage is in control of the system, from my perspective, it's the colonizer system. And so my request to the general public is to acknowledge our function and ability to establish new systems on behalf of our heritage and our ancestry, and then start to walk that path, learn how the world operates and how the world is structured to allow us mm -hmm. as indigenous populations to establish these new institutions and systems, and then begin to start that. And thank you. I, I apologize if I was blabbing, but thank you very much, Mr. Hunt. Thank you. I see uh, my good friend Derek Burnett has weighed in here, and I got to tell you, there's another hero that's been in the fight, struggle, and been out there paid in the path, not by just what he says, but by what he does. You know, Retail, if I could just address something you said, I want to talk about, uh, when you talk about us coming together, you see, the first thing I believe we have to do is change the way we think. And if we don't change the way we think, we're never going to overcome our own issues. You know, we've been beat down so long with lack, uh, uh, told we can't, suppressed, not given opportunities, denied access, whatever it may be. And it beats on your self-image. Red Tail, don't miss this. It beats you to the point where you can't look in the mirror and honor and respect the man you look at because they take from you. And they take from you and they tell you no and you can't. But the truth of the matter is we have to change the way we think. When life gives you lemons, you should never make lemonade. That's the first mistake. When life gives you lemons, you should pick the seeds out of the lemon and plant them so you can grow an orchard. So you'll have abundance. And stop worrying about somebody giving you a drink. Take care of your own self. And so we got to just change the way we think. And we've been subjected so long to this way of thinking that what's happening, this is all we know. This is our this is our default switch. Wait for somebody to give you approval. Wait for somebody to tell you you can. Wait for somebody to say, it's all right. Man, I got to tell you, those days are long past. It's time to push through some obstacles, push through some barriers and set some new standards for ourselves and our children. Donnie, what are you thinking? I, I'm curious to know uh, what, what Tavis, tell them about your center. I think Tavis froze up on us. You still there, Tavis? Is, is Donnie still with us? Well, are you still there, Tavis? I think he did freeze. Okay, maybe I'm come back. Stable space in about uh, three minutes. I'll be able to okay. Be realistic way. Okay. What, what's what's beautiful for me is us uh, having this dialogue, having this conversation, because there's so much information. You know, as I met Tavis and met this lady, Dr. Esther Pearson, uh, I, I've learned that there's so many people that write about indigenous Americans, native culture, and we just need more dialogue like this. To so, so, I mean, the other day I called you up and asked you about a headdress. I asked you about the medicine man. There's so much I want to know. I can tell you this though, ever since I was a kid, I rooted for the Indians in the cowboy and Indian movie. <laughs> that I can tell you. Well, Donnie, Donnie, let me tell you what happened with me when it happened with the Cowboys and Indians. So my neighborhood, I grew up in Southeast Baltimore, right up, right on Broadway, right around the corner, right? So little Joey was Italian across the street. You know, we grew up in a very, what I call melting pot. You know, Tommy, Tommy down the street was Polish, and L Luis, two doors up, was Puerto Rican. Man, it was great. And Tyrone was on the corner. And, you know, Tyrone was my boy. We rode bikes together. And we just had a ball. And we're playing Cowboys and Indians. Man, I remember every time we played Cowboys and Indians, they would say, all right, 
I'm a cowboy. They would shoot me, and you know I gotta fall over. Cause what happened to the cowboys? They always got killed. I mean, the Indians. They always got killed in the movies, right? So you know, I, I'm falling down every time. So I came home. I remember saying to my father, I said, "Tomorrow, Dad, I'm gonna be the cowboy." My father said, "Over my dead body, he'll be the Indian to the day you die." And you know, it's just. Wow. It's indicative of all those things that we've seen growing up, how they've shaped us, man. You know, I I remember the first time I was in high school, man, this boy asked me, was I a half-breed? I was 16 years old. Man, I didn't know nothing about no half-breed, so I kind of like, not bro, I'm Indian. I'm not a half of nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm full. So I went home and asked my mother, man, i never forget that. I said, Mama, we're half-breed? What's that? I thought we was lumpy. Man, my mother started crying. I said, oh, no, no, I got to go back to school. We got to take care of this tomorrow because I think you just insulted me and I didn't know it. And that's when the fight broke out. Yeah, that's when, that's when we had to put him up underneath the bleachers and work him out a little bit. He got worked out some. You know, he ain't going to ask that question no more. And so it was an interesting. I, 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 I take it it wasn't what he asked. It was how he asked it. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's not what you say. It's how you say it to get you in trouble. You already know. And so I, my whole life I've been struggling with that. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times you ask me to ask this. Are you black? What, what national? Are you Italian? I mean, and, you know, it's it's just people look at us and we're so curious about who we are. Now, I'm going to tell you both sides of the equation because I'm not holding nothing back today. You know, I was a former executive director of the Baltimore American Indian Center where I managed the tribal affairs for all, all 40,000 Native Americans in the state of Maryland. And no secret, 1996, when Baltimore's son put me on the front cover of the newspaper, you know, it was a little controversial. I was 35 years old, the youngest executive director they had ever had. And I had some ideas of the way I thought some things should go. And I was an entrepreneur, Dan, Donnie. I'm a compassionate capitalist, and I want to make sure that I'm real clear on that. And this is Chester Street, right? Just right there on Broadway, 113 South Broadway. Okay. Yeah, Chester Street's where they hung out at. That's where the bad boys hung out at. You know, that's why you know that. Stay off Chester Street, Donnie. So, so you know, it was it was in a time where, man, I'm this entrepreneur, but I'm compassionate capitalist. I believe that yes, we got to have some resources, but you don't be greedy about it, right? So I'm, I'm setting my stage here only to discover, man, that was quite an undertaking to try to serve your own people. And and, and I'm telling you that story to say, man, it's been a struggle ever can, since can, I was born. Can you repeat that? What's that? It's a struggle. It's a struggle, Donnie. Serving your own people. Sir, oh, Donnie, let me, let, me, let, me, let me share with you. Your people will wear you out. They will demand more from you than they could ever demand from anybody else. They will never give you a hand up, a hand out, or credit for anything you do. They'll always be criticized and complaining and condemning. Not all of them, but I'm telling you, a vast majority. You can never do enough for them because here's why. It's an, underserved, it's an underserved population. Family too? Huh? Family too? Family. Family's worse. Family come over the house and they, they, they just think you should be able to. I remember being in the executive director of the Baltimore American Indian Center, being in the supermarket in Southeast Baltimore and having people that were from the tribe follow me around, just really just ridiculing me because I couldn't get somebody out of jail and take care of something. And I'm like, look, I need to get these groceries so I can go feed my family tomorrow morning. If you meet me on the steps at 8 a.m., I get there 8 a.m., I get started on this. Right now, like a, we can't wait. And so it's just, you can never do enough. But here's what I do know, Donnie. Here's the most satisfying part about the whole thing. Too much is given, much is required. And that gift that you have inside of you and that calling that you must reach inside of you and find that, what you've been called to do, that's the greatest fulfillment. But brother, they will wear you out. Wear you out. There's a song I said, um, uh, they'll use you until they use you up. Well, you know, that's a song. That's an old school song. And you know who's saying that, right? I want to say. 
He just passed away. Bill Withers. Bill Withers. Yeah. Come on, use me till you can't use me no more. Do, do, do. Yeah. You remember that? Stop acting like you don't, I don't remember that. I want to be used up. I want to I wanna have something in the tank for tomorrow. All right. So let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what um what Miles Monroe, my one of my favorite authors, passed away in a tragic plane accident. He's from Bahama Faith Ministries. Whatever mile came into a, a two or three hour radius, I would always show up. I had to go see Miles talk. Last time I saw Miles on stage, this is what he said. He said, When I die, I want to die empty. I want to get every book, every message, every song out of me because I don't want to take it to the graveyard. So every day I want to be empty, Donnie, by giving so that I can be replenished. Because, man, I tell you, there's a lot of work to be done, man. You've been in the struggle, I'm telling you, for at least 25 years that I remember. And I would ask you this. I would. This is the question I would ask you. Did you ever think this is where you would be? And the answer is no. You had no idea that you were going to go to Africa, that you were going to go to these places. You were going to be at, at on the steps of the Capitol, and you were going to be in the midst of this. No, you didn't know that. That's where your journey is taking you. And so I applaud you, brother, for, for being consistent. I remember talking to you when you told me the governor came to you. I said, look at that boy. That's the same cat I used to hang out with. But that's who you are. You've been, you 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 can't do anything different. You tried. I watched you do the, the successful Black Wall Street program. I watched you. I remember you had Be More News, and I would be like, oh, God, there goes Donnie again. What is he saying today? Can't do nothing different. That's what you're called to do. The only challenge is, you see this gray hair? We can know. And it should be some people. And I'm talking to you if you're listening to me. It's time for you to pick up this leadership mantle and run. It's time for you to take your rightful place and decide what it is that you want to leave. What legacy do you want to leave? You know, a lot of times leadership is something that we don't want to give up to the next generation because we want to hold on to it to the end. Well, I'm here to tell you, I don't have that problem. I'm looking for somebody to mentor right now because the greatest thing I could do is pass on what my mentor gave to me, Dr. Preston Bruce, where he poured into my life for 40 years to develop me to be the person I am today that I might be able to pour into somebody else's life. When I stop pouring, the legacy stops. It's time for us to find some people and it's time for some people to step up and take your rightful place and this leadership mantle in your communities, for your culture, your race, your family. It's imperative, Donnie. You know, I was thinking back when I was a kid, I saw this one cowboy Indian movie and the Indians whooped that Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was, I was a little boy. I was living in East Baltimore, not far from you, Patterson Park and Landville. <laughs> no, no, we were at North and Green Mount then, but I saw all of these Indians mm -hmm. coming across the plains. It was one of my happiest days in childhood mm -hmm. because I saw the Cowboys get mashed. Yeah. And nobody ever talks about it, but there were times when the Cowboys got mashed bad. Okay. So Donnie, here's let's 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 put this into perspective for our for our listening audience. So there's never been a movie you've ever seen, true, fictional fact, whatever may be indifferent, where you've seen Native Americans retreating. They've always, as a people of pride, stood their ground and fought their fight. The problem was we were out, our weaponry, we were out weaponed. You know, you can only shoot about 40 yards with a good bow and arrow and be accurate. But you can shoot from 200 yards with a gun and get somebody real good. And, so, the other, and, and the source of the guns. Yes. Yes. We didn't have the weapons, right? So that was the issue. Second issue was is we had to use our minds to strategically fight these wars. So, you know, we, were, we, had, we had some some tactics that you see used in military. We had some ploys that you see used now around the country. 
And so it's very important that you remember that Native American warrior was a person that never retreated. They were people of pride. And that's the that is the that is the most important thing I, I remember. Yes, there were some times where we did come up on the winning side, if you will. I don't know if there's any such thing as winning side where people are killed, but we came up on the side of not being as killed. And there's some times where, you know, we were slaughtered and massacred. And I'm not sure the true account of history. I wasn't there, but this is what I do know. Never in my life have I met a group of people that's more prouder than Native Americans. Never in my life. I'll share this with you as being the executive director of the Baltimore American Indian Center. It's a story I want to tell you before we got jumped off here is that I remember when I took the powwow, the Native American gathering, our annual event to the to the uh, to the convention center. We historically had had it in Patterson Park, the park you're talking about. And we did that because it was easy for the community to get to. Donnie, the challenge is, is that, remember, I'm the entrepreneur now and I'm coming into this new environment. The challenge is, if we're having a gathering just for our people, let's have one in Patterson Park. But if we want to reach the masses, if we want to do something where we can educate everybody, let's have it in a larger venue. And I remember having it there. And this was, I forgot if Kurt Smoke was in administration at the time. I, I think he was. Uh, we were able to secure that. And I remember just sitting there watching white people come up to me and say, man, I got Indian in me, man. Can't you tell I'm, I, I'm, I got Indian. I remember black people coming to me, man, I got Indian in me. Here's my point. By opening it up to a larger group of people, people got to feel a sense of who they were. Who am I to say you don't have Indian in me? Who am I to judge that you're not from a tribe? It gave people this sense, right, of bringing them together. And when I look back at that, I think that was very important that we open doors to let people come in. Stop holding the door closed. So let me ask you, and believe it or not, I saw some people from that cultural center. What's the name of it? Native American? Baltimore American Indian Center. I saw some people from the Baltimore American Indian Center marching it was a social issue, but it was it was a walk on Pennsylvania Avenue. This is maybe not long after Freddie Gray. I can and believe they, that. And they had had their indigenous clothing on. And it's I'll never regalia. Regalia. And I'll never forget just how beautiful that was. So it prompts me to ask you, yes, when is the next gathering? Okay, very good question. Well, um, I'm going to tell you when it historically is, and then we're going to hope the pandemic's going to cooperate. But we normally have a gathering um, a couple times a year. The first thing you should do is go out to the Baltimore American Indian Center website. I believe it's BAC.org, and there's a list of events out there. You also can Google powwows. Everybody's pretty familiar with Google. Just Google powwows, powwow, Native American gathering. That's what that is. And it'll tell you the ones in your area because I know we got people from all around the country on here. So there's some people that want to go to maybe the ones that are local to them. But here in the state of Maryland, ours is historically held in June. But you should all know, and this is where you can help me, to everyone listening, in November is Native American Heritage Month. I did not know. And I am asked to speak around the country extensively that month. So you need to get me early because I'm going to be booked by July and August. And there could be a couple days left in September, but probably not because November is Native American Heritage Month. And we need to really have a celebration around that. So in Maryland, we have our powwow in June. Then we have the, the folks down in, in, in uh, Southern Maryland, the, the Piscataway, they have their powwows. I'm not sure the exact dates. They have theirs. And there's quite a few other gatherings in the state of Maryland. So I would encourage you. Donnie, I think that's B-A-I-C. You don't have to spell out Baltimore American Indian Center. I just think it's B-A-I-C.org. Let me make sure. Let me get on my iPad here real quick. 
So I'm almost sure that's what it is. And you can just go there and um and just search the calendar. I, they should have a calendar on there. And you can take a look at upcoming events. We also have a museum there. For everybody on here, please go, go by and, and, and take a chance to look at the museum. Uh, no, that's not it, Donnie. I don't know what. I, I thought it was BAIC org. What in the world is this? Yeah, that's no. not it. They got something else going on there. Baltimore so, American Indian. So let's 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 get that one fact. I did not know that November is Native in, American Heritage Month. Yep. I'm gonna tell you how deep my studies went. Okay, Donnie, here it is. You were absolutely right. It is Baltimore American Indian Center org. I don't know why I didn't know that. Man, thank you, Donnie. Baltimore American Indian Center org. The, the, the number you, the, the address you have on the screen. So November's Native American Heritage Month. And you know, this is what I call outreach time. It's time to educate. I've been known since I do a lot of work with the state of Maryland. Um, a, a fine gentleman, I'm, I certainly want to give his name today, Lewis Jones with the Maryland Department of Transportation had me come and speak many, many years ago uh, at, a Native Amer at a Native American gathering that he had, a diversity gathering that he had, and he asked me as a Native American speaker to kick off the event. Lewis Jones down at MDOT. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's the EEO officer. And so as a result, um, you know, that's kind of been my story now is in November, is using that month to really educate people about the culture, and tell people, you know, kind of just a little bit of history. You know, my video speaks to some history, but I go into far more detail from stage. You know, I talk about um, the racism I learned at home. I talk about the cultural plight that I had, you know, of, of not being accepted by the color of my skin, how growing outside of the community, you know, everybody's aspiration was to do better. So I left the inner city and moved to the suburbs, got the, you know, the, the single family house, the two car garage, the dog, the three kids, whatever it is, you know, and I talk about how it still was a struggle to be accepted. And then I talk about what it does to your own self-image when your people don't accept you, they almost ostracize you when you move away or you, you decide that you're going to do something different. And so I talk about all those things. And, and I'm sure the African-American population and many of the other cultures on here can relate to those stories that we're like crabs in a basket, Donnie. People of color are like crabs in a basket. No, I'm not buying that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I believe this. I believe that when one tries to move out, it's easier to pull them down than to help them out because the I, truth I don't, is I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Okay. Well, I, I, re I respect that. I, I buy this. I hear people saying it, but that's not. I can't allow that to be to hinder me from oh, doing. It don't hinder me. Oh no, it don't hinder me. It's just the reality. Look, let me let, let me let me just. Somebody can pull you down if you let them pull you yeah. down, uh, or you can pull them up. Yeah, absolutely. But it's it's harder to pull somebody up when twenty of them's on your leg. So let, let me, me tell you, let, let me give you let me give you some Steve Harvey. All right, come on. If he lived in Baltimore, he would tell you he would not answer any four four three phone calls. <laughs> okay, uh, let me give you let me tell you what Ti said. <laughs> Ti said, "Haters get on your job because some people just love it to be motivated by that." So, but I'm just making this uh, analogy here that a lot of times. People want you to be where they're at. And when you outgrow their way of thinking, when you outgrow their mentality, when you outgrow their dreams, their goals. And Donnie, let me tell you, it just don't happen in cultures. It happens in marriages. It happens in relationships. One person outgrows the other. It happens in families. One if, person if, aspires to something else. If we're not growing together, then we're dying together. How about that? And now, what's now, if, if, when, when, when I go to the old neighborhood, 
and a cat is standing on the same corner doing the same thing that he was doing 35 years ago that's right did i move on or did they never grow well i don't know i just know that if a hey, muhammad ali said show me a man who thinks the same way today as he did 20 years ago and i'll show you a man who wasted 20 years see i look at it like this he's found his comfort zone and he's happy where he's at see it's not my goal to oh, tell him oh oh but the first thing out their mouth is let me hold a couple dollars well i call in my neighborhood we call it gimme and hammy that's, give me a that's like, it's, like and it's a come back to the hood tax yeah well he you, you learn you learn when you come back to the hood you stay in the car you don't get out the car you can wave hey how y'all doing no nah, no nah, i got somewhere to go no nah, some, <laughs> some 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 of us decided to not do what we ought to be doing oh, and I it's never too that. late it's never too that. late to face the music but what we should not accept is excuses well, Donnie, I'm, a, I'm only I only can talk about me, and this is what I can tell you. It wasn't until I changed the way that I was thinking that I saw a different life. And as mean? long as I was looking through her eyes and the lens that kept me trapped in the body that I didn't belong, I was gonna have to stay there. I controlled my destiny the day that I decided I was taking ownership for my life, and I was gonna change the way that I think. You know, here you go, Donnie. Is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? I Which say half, is half full. No, it's not. It's half, it's half. No. The glass is running over. You better hold your feet up there about to get wet. Because, see, you got to change the way you think. By the way, who wants a half a glass of anything? You got to see abundance. You got to see beyond what it is. If you don't have the vision to see what it's going to be before it is, You'll never get there. So it's all about perception. I was fortunate. I had a man come into my life at age 18. I told you, Dr. Preston Bruce spent 40 years working on this hard end. And all he would tell me every day, and this is what's missing in our community, please don't miss this, is looking another male child or female child in the eyes and saying this, I believe in you, but then go one step further. I am here to help you any way I can. Cause that's what's missing. Yeah, you can tell them you believe in them, and then when you leave, you go, you go away, and you'll never come back. But just tell them I believe in you, and I'm here to help you. And if you don't think so, here's my number. Put me to the test. That's what we got to do, brother. We got to raise up. Thank you for motivating us today. Any final thoughts, Mr. Milton Hunt? Absolutely. If you're looking for a dynamic, high-impact, energized speaker, look no further. There's three things that have to happen if you're planning an event right now. You have to have, first, the right speaker. The second thing you must have, if you're planning an event right now, you must have the right audience. And the third thing that is imperative that you have is you have to have the right message. Now I've seen a lot of speakers, and there's some fantastic ones. But come work with me, and we'll deliver those three things for you. Donnie, thank you so much for your time. Man, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Promise me won't, we won't stay gone so long, Donnie. Won't ever happen again. Me. Won't ever happen again. Hey, right. you didn't tell me your mama was a supermodel, man. Boy, get out of here. I saw your mama, man. My mama was gorgeous. Your mama was gorgeous, man. But let me tell you what mama used to say. So my mother was a Locklear, right? And my father was a Hunt. So in my tribe, Locklear and Hunt carry the two prominent, they're pretty prominent surnames of the tribe. Now, my mother was clear. The Hunt's very hard-headed, but we're ambitious, and we're going to get it done. But, you know, we got a little problem up here now. We don't, we don't always see, you know, the way it should be, but we're going to get it done. And the likely is, this is what my mother was saying, it's the best looking group of Indians that there is. So I'm glad you at least got some Locklear in you, she's always saying. But my mother was a real character when it came to the tribal issues. My father was dead set on, you're going to be Indian till you die. 
And my mother was really kind of like, oh, I'm not real sure you should be around them. <laughs> Donnie, thank you. Mom, mom was beautiful. Thank you. Love and respect. And I love the video, MiltonHunt.net. Uh, we got to do this again soon. Yes, let's do it. Donnie, thank you so much, brother. Good Have deal. a wonderful Have a day. day. And thank all you right. to all of those people with all of the content uh, comments. Jamil, thank you. Uh, Derek Burnett, thank you. And everybody else. We'll see you yeah, all. Derek, right. shout out for me, man. Derek, hey, that's my boy. Yeah, Derek Burnett. Yeah. Mr. Baseball. Yeah, that's him. All right, Donnie, be good. Yes, big brother.